It's good to see all four of you. <laughs> oh man, Eric ain't kidding about a hearty bunch. <laughs> so look, it's, it's pretty self-evident to all of you. I'm getting to finally live out a lifelong dream of achieving a profound and highly sought after honor to be the last speaker of the day. Yep. So, so the question I've been asking myself in the back is, what did I do to deserve this spot? So I think I've come up with a few explanations. Number one, Governor Brown chose the speaking order. That's not right. I know, that's not right. <laughs> I could have said Ann Gust or Sutter. <laughs> Number two, after an entire day of showcasing the extraordinary diversity of California Democrats, women, people of color, LGBT leaders, young, old, Jewish, Muslim, all people in positions of power, uh, they wanted to clearly anchor the show with someone with none of those things, uh, especially the position of power part. <laughs> and number three, they're afraid, they are, they are afraid of this. They're afraid that John Travolta, the same, yes, John Travolta was going to come out and introduce me as Gordon Nazim. <laughs> and number four, and this may actually be the real reason, uh, the party makes a lot of money if people leave early and head to the bar, uh, which clearly many folks have. So I, I am sincerely happy that uh, some of you took the time to, to remain. And, and I am honored. I've had a great time this weekend. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Uh, you are the lifeblood of this party. It's true. Uh, and, and I want to say this, you know, I, I've thought a lot about this. You know, it's not Californians that occupy official offices in the state capitol or city halls, but everyday Californians that advocate and organize and elevate our local communities that matter most. And, and, and I've had an opportunity you know, this last year to meet literally thousands and thousands of Californians, but I had a really remarkable meeting with an extraordinary leader by the name of Ken Robinson not too long ago. We were talking about the issue of leadership. And he told me this amazing story. He told me a story about what happened 10 years ago in 2004, when in the fall of that year, in Death Valley, something extraordinary happened. Some seven inches of rain fell almost overnight in the driest and hottest place on the planet. And just a few short months later, in the spring of 2005, the entire valley was carpeted with wildflowers. It turns out Death Valley wasn't dead, it was dormant. The seeds of possibility had been planted years and years ago, waiting for the right conditions to come along. And when the right conditions come along, success, Ken said, becomes irresistible. Simply said, what he was fundamentally saying was success is synergistic with environment. Leadership has never been about command and control. It's about climate control. It's about creating the right conditions where success becomes irresistible. Think about it. Think about some of the most transformative leaders in the world. Think about Nelson Mandela and how so many of us have reflected on his extraordinary life. His legacy, I think you would agree with me, his legacy wasn't defined by his very short tenure as president of South Africa, but by his decades of leadership exercising his moral authority. A few months ago, when we commemorated the March on Washington, we didn't celebrate ex-president Martin Luther King. We celebrated a leader who each and every day exercised his moral authority. On Cesar Chavez Day in California, we don't celebrate an ex-governor. We celebrate a leader who didn't need a title to make change. He recognized, like all of you recognize, that being in power doesn't necessarily mean you have power. You know, at the peak of their influence, think about this, Chavez, King, Mandela, none of them had formal authority, but they all amplified human potential. They all stepped up and they stepped in. They didn't want to wait to be something to do something. And now more than ever, now more than ever, we need real leaders that challenge the status quo. And that leadership can be found anywhere. 
You know, it was that leadership that we found on another day in 2004 when Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin gave us the courage in San Francisco to stand up and stand on principle and throw open the doors of San Francisco City Hall to more than 4,000 couples from 46 states, including Stuart Gaffney and John Lewis, who are both here today. Thank you, Stuart and John, for taking the time. You know, it was folks like Stuart and John, it was those couples, it was their courage that seeded the movement, that created the conditions that allowed us to have and win millions of conversations across this nation about marriage equality, whether we liked it or not. You know, this has always been, this has always been California's edge, hasn't it? Rooted in our demography, our geography, our culture, our ability to make invisible the visible, to create the necessary conditions where success, again, becomes irresistible. We, we've done it on immigration reform. We've done it on environmental protection. We've done it on workers' rights. We've done it on labor rights and reproductive rights, on the minimum wage and on health care reform. That's the metal to which we are all forged. But our work, you know this, it's not yet done. Take, for example, the prison overcrowding. You know, I'll take you back. 1977, wasn't that long ago, when we did away with indeterminate sentencing. Our prison population in California was roughly 20,000 people. By 2007, our prison population exploded to 173,000. Our nation, with just 5% of the world's population, incarcerates roughly 2.4 million people, 25% of the world's prisoners. It's no coincidence, you know this, it's no coincidence how these numbers grew so quickly over the last four decades. It was in 1971 when Richard Nixon, a Californian, declared the war on drugs as a backlash to massive shifts in cultural values. Attorney General Eric Holder was right when he recognized the adverse fiscal and moral and social impact that the war on drugs and minimum mandatory sentences are having on our society. And since the 1970s, our learning curve on the war on drugs has cost the taxpayers in excess of $1 trillion and counting. And that's not even the most significant cost to our failed policies. Over that same period of time, the United States of America has spent over $120 billion to arrest some 37 million people for nonviolent drug offenses. Think about that. Nearly the entire population, the equivalent of the entire population of our great state. 1.5 million people. They were arrested in this country in 2012 alone for nonviolent drug offenses, over half for marijuana. More than 200,000 Almost a quarter of a million college students have lost their financial federal aid due to drug convictions because prosecuting kids, apparently, was more important than giving them the financial means to go to college. <laughs> states, states wasted more than $3.6 billion on marijuana possession and enforcement in 2010, money that wasn't used and wasn't available for preschool and after school and health care and foster care and treatment on demand or even to fight violent crimes. And all of this, all of this, and I'm not even talking about the millions of people sent back into our prisons on parole violations because they simply failed a drug test. How many lives have to be derailed before we realize the learning curve is too slow and too costly? How long before we realize that drug addiction isn't a crime, it's a disease? There never was, there never was, and dare I say, never will be a society free of drugs, as much as we'd like there to be. So it's time for all of us to step up and step in and lead once again in California, just as we did in 1996. Remember, we did just that with medical marijuana. We were the first state in this nation, but for almost 20 years now, we've sat back admiring our accomplishment while the world, the nation, 
and states like Colorado and Washington have passed us by. I made it clear last year, almost to the day, as I stood here before this very body, that it's time to legalize, it's time to tax, it's time to regulate marijuana for adults in California. But, but we have to start with a serious dialogue, a serious dialogue. This issue cannot get caught up in the Nixonian trap of calling people's names whose values we do not share. This is a serious debate for serious people. This is not a debate about hippies. This is not a debate about stoners. We can't diminish this issue or the people involved in this debate by belittling them and trivializing them. Let me be clear. You can be pro-regulation without being an advocate for drug use. I have three young, extraordinary children, and I am not an advocate for recreational drug use. Quite the contrary. My children are lucky, however, like so many of your children, that when they skin their knees, mom and dad are there to help make it better. But other children, sadly, are not so lucky. Think about this. Tonight in this country, when you go to bed, over a million children will go to bed themselves with at least one of their parents in jail or prison for a nonviolent drug offense. That's one million children. Tonight, they can only dream about getting a hug from mom and dad because the harsh reality is the next time they see that parent will be through clear, bulletproof glass or behind bars. That's the real cost of a slow learning curve on the war on drugs, the human cost. The cost, the cost of a parent, the cost of a parent being separated from a child because of a nonviolent drug offense that carries a ridiculous mandatory minimum. The cost of a child growing up in a single family home because somewhere along the line we thought it was smarter to prosecute a father rather than educating that father. The cost the cost of an inconsolable parent who must cope with the loss of a child to a drug overdose because we care more about defining drugs as a criminal issue rather than a health care issue. That's why I've joined. I'm passionate about this. I really am. That's why I joined forces with the ACLU to form a Blue Ribbon Commission to research and to analyze and educate the public in an effort to ensure that if and when marijuana is legalized in California, it could be done safely and effectively and implemented in a way that maintains our health, our well-being, and our safety in diverse communities. It's time to get past our reactionary fears about drugs. It's time we implement policies rooted in science developed with compassion, framed as health issues instead of criminal issues, because that's exactly what they are. And once and for all, it's time we realize that the war on drugs is nothing more, too often than not, is nothing more than a war on communities of color and on the poor. It's time, it's time fundamentally for drug policies that, that recognize and respect the full dignity of human beings. We can't wait. We've been walking into the future backwards for too long. If you see something you want to change, then you need to exercise your moral authority on poverty and homelessness, on income inequality that's dividing our state. We need to stand up, we need to step in, and we need to exercise our moral authority on the death penalty on mandatory minimums, on this war on drugs. We need to stand up, we need to step in and exercise our moral authority. On our broken immigration system, we need to stand up, we need to step in, and we need to exercise our moral authority. On the minimum wage and on a living wage, we need to step up, we need to step in and exercise our moral authority. In every respect in our lives, we must resist becoming bystanders because there's simply too much at stake. Dr. King wasn't a bystander. Mandela wasn't a bystander. Cesar Chavez wasn't a bystander, nor was Gandhi, Parks, or Havel. They weren't bystanders. They had purpose-driven missions. They led each and every day with moral authority. They didn't wait around for the guy or gal on the white horse to come save the day. They stepped up. They stepped in. 
They believed in solutions to be harnessed, not problems to be managed. And they created, as we all must, the necessary conditions where success becomes irresistible. Thank you all very, very much.